I'm Dave Salento with DigiFab Lab. Um, what I do is help people with digital tools, learn about them and use them. And this is our third night of uh, conversations regarding SCLO's first Maker Week. And we're delighted to have Tom Lowerman here. He's an artist from Penn State. He teaches in uh, the School of Visual Arts. And Tom is a really interesting blend of, uh, I would call him technologist, artist, and um, maker. So it's hard to put him in a category, which is one of the things I like about Tom. I've known him for a few years, and he brings a, a tremendous amount of energy and inquiry into the, uh, the act of making at Penn State. So Tom's going to show us a little bit about what they're doing up there tonight. And this is a pretty loose format. Uh, Tom will speak for a little while, and then I'm thinking, you know, no longer than about half hour at most, right? I don't know how long you're thinking. All right. And then we'll just have a little Q&A, informal dialogue that you guys might have about uh, how what Tom's talking about might affect you or how, what opportunities you see. And then I'll sort of pass the mic around for those questions so we can get them on tape. All right, so Tom, thank Great. you for coming. Thank you, Dave. Can you hear me if the mic, uh, the mic works? All right, fantastic. Let me get situated here. Um, from beginning. Okay, and then I assume we've got some lights there. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dave, for that introduction, and uh, Nathaniel and everyone at Schlau for having me out. Um, it's really great to uh, be here and talk about um, what we're doing there and, and to try and make some inroads to um, this kind of larger maker community that seems like it's really starting to develop in a really interesting way in State College. Um, when you get real busy with courses at the university, you can kind of um, lose touch with what's going on, so I really welcome the opportunity to... Um, I've met a lot of people, even though the week has just started, and um, it's great to, to kind of put people together. Also, I, I'm an artist, and I teach in the art school, so I don't have um, unlimited opportunities to, to meet people who might be engineers, architects, designers, anthropologists, all these people who are using some of these tools. Um, so it, an event like this is also good for that. Ironically, there are some colleagues from Penn State I've gotten to know better through this program than I do when I'm doing my job, because I'm doing my job when I'm doing my job. So, um, I'm not like a person who would have naturally, uh, I, I didn't study all this stuff, and I have no background in engineering, um, but I have gotten very, very interested in uh, digital fabrication and the whole, I guess you would call it a maker movement, people um, working with circuitry and Arduino circuit controllers and 3D printing and um, laser cutting and CNC milling, and all these ways that you can design things um, have them interact with the computer and, and um, become something else, whether it's a fully digital product or something that's some sort of hybrid. Um, and I guess what I really wanted to talk about is a kind of DIY or do-it-yourself approach to that, which is um, something I've kind of settled on both out of necessity but also out of, um, really out of preference. Um, as somebody who was trained as an artist and for many years uh, was just having a go of it as an artist without teaching at a university, I was always interested in technology, but I always felt like a lot of these things were way out of my reach. So um, I became aware of 3D printing and some of these things about 10 years ago. And I distinctly remember calling places that had some of this equipment as an artist with no affiliation to anything and just saying, like, could I 3D print the thing? And I would either get the immediate no or, or they would say, you know, well, if you do a run of a thousand of them, uh, we can do it for several thousand dollars. And, you know, none of those were appealing options. Um, so in the last few years, really the last five years, the whole landscape of accessibility to these tools has changed. Um, the tools themselves, I don't think have changed so much. Um, and so I want to talk about that, and I'll talk about that by showing a lot of projects uh, that are student projects. And the ones that I like best are ones that um, you could do with a pretty minimal um, setup. And so I started with this first slide because this is a, um, two students uh, making a 3D scan. And this is a, a thing that we'll do tomorrow here in the library. We'll have a scanning event where we'll have a little scanner and you can make a scan of your head and we'll save that as a digital file. And if you wanted to, you could take that digital file, you could have it printed in any number of locations. So I think officially you guys are linking up at the UPS store, um, but of course any of the machines uh, in town or elsewhere could print that type of file. And the reason I like this one so much is um, this student, Nagar Fadai, is uh, holding a Microsoft Xbox Connect, which is a very common uh, video game controller. 
Um, it wasn't even that popular, right? Like amongst the Xbox people. So I don't even own an Xbox, but I got that Kinect on eBay for about $30. And then I got some software to run it. And um, not for all types of things, but for scanning people, it really works very, very well. Um, so you can see on the right, that's a, a very high quality full figure scan. And then um, I have things I'll kind of pass out. This was just printed the other day. Um, this is a, a student, Nikki Lau, and she works with clay. She's making a whole figure, but she's really struggling with her face. And I said, why don't we just print your face? We can make a mold from it. You can press some clay into there, and then you can like attach that to what you've already got. So maybe I'll pass that around as a large scale um, 3D print from a scan. It's not the most detailed thing. There are other scanners on campus that are more high resolution, but I guarantee you they weren't $30 on eBay, right? Um, when I arrived at Penn State, this is year five for me that I'm just starting. Um, Dave, you were involved in producing this map of all the um, digital fabrication network on campus. That sort of survey, I think, had just happened. And so it was very exciting to me. I had previously been teaching at a, a standalone art school that didn't have you know, engineering and architecture and these other places that were well-funded and well-supplied and things like that. Um, so it was exciting to me that there were all these different machines on the campus. But of course, if you did this survey now, and we were joking about this, that this would be so much, there were, like it wouldn't fit. There would be too many machines and whatnot. Um, and so it was a really interesting thing to suddenly have access, because I was for so long in the position of not really having access to the, this equipment. So these are just some other examples of scanning. This is what we'll try and do tomorrow. Um, and it's pretty easy. You can just sit in a chair and kind of rotate with your, uh, you know, on your tiptoes. And, uh, and get a good scan from that. And so um, as somebody who's trained in ceramics and sculpture and traditional things, I'm really interested in how people um, use this technology. So this is a guy named Roberto Lugo who graduated recently with the ceramics MFA, wonderful artist whose career is really blowing up now. And he doesn't want to be a, a digital artist or he's not really technically inclined, but he does a lot of self-portraiture and he wanted to get a good face scan and then do some things with it. So here this was milled out on a CNC machine um, that looks like this. And this is in the Stuckman School of Architecture. And I, I get a little bit worried about some of these situations because I feel like this is really great for my student to use. But most of my art students when they graduate are not going to hook themselves up with a, however much money that cost machine. Pretty pricey machine. So it's a bit of a, you know, I always go back and forth about, you know, should I introduce them to software that costs $10,000 if it's the thing that they need? Because they're never going to use that afterwards. Um, because there isn't the expectation that they would graduate into some large um, organization that would provide all this for them. But nonetheless, the equipment's there. We have access to it. It's really great to use. But it did start me thinking about things like this. So on the left is a 3D printer that some students were building, and on the right is a little tiny CNC mill that's being built. It's not that good. <laughs> it can't do that, right? But it can kind of do that, and it's getting there. It's much smaller, but it's only about $600 worth of stuff, which is not a small amount of money, but in the realm of CNC machines, uh, there are machines on campus that are six figures, right? So um, it's something, and it uses a little Dremel tool as a cutting um, tool. Uh, and it's somewhat limited in what it could do, but it was really wonderful to, we got these as kit components and, and to have the students kind of assemble them. Art students, by the way, no background in electrical engineering or, or uh, mechanical engineering, anything like that. And it worked out pretty well. And so I'll show some examples. Um, it's fun to see, I think also in the School of Visual Arts, we tend to sort of misuse the equipment. Um, you know, we, we just do, people don't always understand what we want to do with the tools. Uh, and sometimes things turn out wonderfully. So this is actually the result of that very first slide, that first scan. This was milled out of foam, this portrait bust. Um, and then it was um, coated in several layers of plaster. A mold was made from it. It was cast in ceramic. It was glazed. And it's this wonderful permanent um, thing. And uh, this student was talking about um, her heritage and, and um, all kinds of personal issues through the piece. And it was wonderful to see it go through all these steps of um, digital fabrication. But in the end, you have a thing that is very hard to figure out exactly how it was made. And Roberto, who I showed a moment ago, we 3D printed or, or milled his head. We made some molds from it. And he was able to cast a little ceramic version of his head. Um, but then that turned into this uh, amazing piece where he has the 3D printed components were cast, and those became these two busts on either side. And then this large form in the middle is all wheel thrown, and he's hand-built things on there and painted it in a number of different ways. 
So it's just awesome to me as an instructor to see like where people take this. And 98% of what went into this was handwork, but it was really useful to have this very accurate um, scan that became this profile head on there. So I love it when these things kind of merge together. Here's another variation of that where he was taking his own uh, portrait and kind of smashing them together, this kind of negative connotation to it. Um, another student named Brooks Oliver, um, who again works with ceramics. I teach in the area of ceramics, also in sculpture, a little bit in new media and a tiny bit in foundations over there. Um, and I try and incorporate these tools into as many of those areas as I can, broaden people's um, uh, sense of what they can do. So these are wonderful, eccentric, uh, mostly functional vases and, and um, uh, and things that sit on the table, and they're all made from uh, milled foam, but originally they're designed on a computer and computer software and milled out and turned into ceramic. Um, there are things like this that you wouldn't think were part of that whole process, but um, I had a student in photography who was doing these, these interesting kind of, she would photograph old master paintings and almost sort of do graffiti over the top of them, and we all decided she should have a really ornate frame for them, and so we sort of went online, like, what does an ornate frame cost? If you've ever tried to price a really old, vintage, beautiful, ornate frame, they can be just as expensive as a really old, vintage, beautiful painting, right? So um, we asked the Palmer Museum of Art on campus if we could bring a little 3D scanner over and scan a really elaborate frame that was already there. And it was really funny because they said, yeah, you can do that. And they said, you know, art school is always asking us to do stuff, and we always say no because we're always worried you're going to damage something. But in this case, you don't actually have to touch anything. You're, just, you're basically taking you know, images and, and running a little laser across it. You can actually, they were so excited to actually give us permission. And um, it wasn't easy, 3D scanning's a pain in the neck, um, but all we, were, all we had to do was go from here to here, um, and then from here to here, I think, or maybe we just did that, and then we just mirrored and flipped and joined the thing together, which I'm making sound easier than it was. But then we were able to mill this whole thing again out of, um, I think it was some kind of MDF or wood or something like that, and all these successive layers of paint went on there. Um, so it was really interesting. Another thing I want to talk about uh, as far as these tools, um, we do a lot with laser cutting. And again, a laser cutter is not a very accessible tool. Um, I've looked at them. I think the cheapest ones are several thousand dollars, and the most expensive ones are just through the roof. But nonetheless, maker spaces like you see cropping up in places, a, a laser cutter seems like the type of tool that um, you know, a, a makerspace might have access to. And once you do have access to it, it's a very easy tool to use. So all kinds of interesting things happen. These are just, um, you know, little student experiments working with textures, um, you know, just cutting through paper. A little bit hard to see, but this is um, a drawing that a student made in a very tiny sketchbook, and we just kind of enlarged it and, and had it etched across these wooden panels. Um, all these experimental things, and I love seeing where people take this stuff. The laser cutter can cut, it can also etch. So here's somebody cut this heart out and then etched this uh, drawn line. And what I like is I, I encourage, I, I love it when the students um, bring an aesthetic that's not rigid and boxy and, and, and what we think of as digital, but they draw with uh, you know marker in the sketchbook and then we find it just a way to just scan that in and kind of translate the line quality that these things have. Um, so the laser cutter has been really great to kind of experiment with in, in low cost and sort of low risk. You know, if things go horribly wrong, you can just get another sheet of paper or cardboard or what have you. This I thought was interesting, the idea of modeling a form and then, you know, cutting it out of the plexiglass and then stacking that up as a way to make a sculptural object. A little bit hard to see, but there's a, a human figure in here. Um, so we did that same scanning process. We split the model into these little panels and then put it back together and you can kind of see uh, Gabriel sitting there. And then sometimes we don't use any of the technical stuff, like this looks like it's laser cut, but it's a huge decorative object and it was all cut by hand, but we can use some of the software to sort of um, just figure out if you had to slice this object into many parts, you know, how would you uh, then assemble it? And then we could project that onto a huge sheet of cardboard and cut it out, do that type of thing. Um, I also like the laser cutter because even though it's an expensive tool, at the end of the day, you could do everything that it does by hand. So there's a nice kind of connection to it that way, like if you had the patience. Um, we did a little workshop with the Discovery Space. These are some uh, kids at the Discovery Space. We made a puzzle that dealt with fractals. And it was really fun because it was a very elaborate um, digital file. But uh, we could hand it off to the kids and see what they liked and what they didn't like. And then you could go back and just recut the whole thing based on their feedback. So it's not like you know, once you've made it and they decided they don't like it and they don't want to play with it, that you're done. 
you can kind of keep iterating really easily. Um, so again, I just love it when these things merge, um, hand processes and some of these digital processes. My wife is also an artist. She's in the process of making a life-size 1979 Lincoln uh, Mark V, which you see here, out of cardboard. There's a long story, backstory to that I won't get into. But she needed some help figuring out, I just need the basis of it, and then I want to skin this thing. So again, we got a little toy model, made a little scan of it, and then started slicing it up and, and assembling this thing together. Um, but what she really does is all this wonderful handwork that has nothing to do with the computer. Um, and to me, it, it, I, I, I don't want to see this as a binary between like new digital tools and everything we used to do. They're, it's really great when they kind of fit together. That's her feet there, yeah, sticking out. <laughs> it's come a long way since then, but it's got a long way to go. Um, and then it's interesting to see that the, there's kind of like tiers to the technology. So um, we can all have the experience of cutting with an X-Acto blade. If you were to automate that, you have something like a laser cutter. And then at a more extreme level, there are things like a CNC-controlled plasma cutter. So this is a little hard to see, but it's a figure on its side. And it's been cut out of steel um, with a really, really sophisticated machine that um, nobody would have in their home. But at the same time, it's nice to know, like, I can do this with scissors. And if it turns out really well, and I, as an artist, I showed it to someone who was really interested in it, like the town of State College or something, then we could you know, put a proposal together and have this fabricated. And, and the communication between an artist and a fabricator, or an artist and a landscape architect, or an artist and an architect, becomes so much easier because you're, you can all move these files back and forth and kind of manipulate them. So it's a little bit better relationship. Um, you can laser cut textiles, paper, just about any kind of thing. So what I'm, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, archaic technologies, partly because I can afford them, right? So I came across uh, pen plotters, which I have too many up now, and I'm trying to get rid of a few. But um, a pen plotter is essentially an older device uh, that predates inkjet printing. And so an architecture firm would have had one of these to draw blueprints and things. Um, I think they finally quit making them like in the early 1990s. And so you can find these things on eBay. And what's kind of humorous to me is it's just as sophisticated as the laser cutter, except instead of cutting, it's drawing a little marker around. Um, and instead of being unbelievably expensive, I've found some of these for you know, basically the cost of shipping. Uh, it takes a little doing to kind of hook them up to your computer. But it's been a great thing. I have these students working with digital files, and we can just stick a marker in there and get this wonderful output of their digital file. Um, vinyl cutters, same kind of deal, where you can you know, use a machine that will cut vinyl and, and put them on them. Those are very accessible things. And I'll talk a lot about um, 3D printing, which is, sorry, uh, the thing that I have done the most. And um, there, cookie cutters were, were yesterday here. So um, that's something we, we do a lot of as a way to sort of introduce people to the technology, especially to introduce them to 3D modeling, which can be much more difficult in some respects than actually running the machines that print the things, um, generating the file. But a cookie cutter is fairly straightforward. You can translate a drawing fairly easily. Um, but there is a part of me that really wants to move past a kind of mode of trinketness, right? Like the, the, you're dealing with plastic, it's often brightly colored, often very, very brittle. Limited use for that. So um, how do you get past that? It's hard, but we're, we're, we're kind of looking at that stuff. Um, but one of the things that's great about 3D printing is it just allows you to experiment with things. So this was a ceramic student who had all these drawings of pots that he couldn't make on a potter's wheel because of like structural limitations of the material. So we printed them really little, but it was very gratifying just to see them, right? Um, so getting back to this map, um, a few years ago, um, our area in the School of Visual Arts got a, a MakerBot printer, uh, this one here, um, which was about, at the time, $2,000, which was a huge investment for us, but I guess in the grand scheme of things at the university, not, not an overwhelming amount of money. It was one of the first machines that seemed consumer accessible or prosumer accessible, or however we want to um, determine that. And so I kind of thought, I'll, we'll get that because it looks really professional. I won't have to spend a lot of time like fixing it or taking it apart because I don't know anything. I don't want to do any of that. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't really work out like that. The thing needed quite a lot of um, constant maintenance. And, and I had to learn a lot about it once we had it. I was always fixing this machine. Um, so it was a bit of a disappointment, but it was also super exciting when you saw the potential of it. Like hopefully you have, if you haven't come across 3D printing before, as you, as you see some of the things that are being made here this week, um, so I, I, I started to sense the limitations of it, and um, because of that little map or, or some 
word of mouth or something, I stumbled into the engineering design area on campus. And this really inspired me to see this. So this is um, printers built by students, and they're all um, open source, meaning that the plans are posted online. And they all cost about, in the neighborhood, I would say about $500 each, which suddenly is like, we're in the territory of less than a laptop, which in my mind, suddenly this is accessible stuff for quite a lot of people, if not everybody. Um, they didn't all work perfectly, clearly, and they were cannibalizing one to make the other work, um, but it was really inspiring, and, and I'm kind of banging my head against the wall with this $2,000 machine, and, and they're getting pretty good quality with these things. So I started to really look into that, and, um, and last year I finally took the plunge and was like, you know what, I've got to build one of these things, because I spent so much time tearing apart the machine that we had, I've got to just do this. So this was my um, desk, and I didn't know what I was doing, so it took me way longer than it should have. I ordered the wrong parts. You know, all kinds of things went wrong. Um, but uh, slowly, it just, kinda, it just kind of started to work out. And then the thing that I had as an advantage is that I, I know design software really pretty well, and so I just started redesigning all the parts, which was not the best way to make the thing quickly, but I couldn't help myself. Like if it, you know, printed part was real blocky and, it, to my opinion, kind of ugly. I would go in there and make it look like some vintage bicycle component, which didn't help the printer at all, but it allowed me to, like, you know, invest myself in this process. And that just went on and on. But because these were open source designs, I then posted my design files, and I wasn't improving the printer, but people did like the way they looked. So I, every now and then, I see another one that has one of the, one of the things that I designed on there, which is great, because... I've certainly taken a lot more from that community than I've given back. So what would you think that would cost you to put together? Five, about $500. <clears throat> I did it piecemeal. Not, also not the best idea, but uh, literally like, okay, now I'm going to go to Ace Hardware and get 14 uh, nylon locking nuts, and then tomorrow I'm going to order smooth rod, and you know, then I'll do this. And I was printing, it has a lot of printed components. I was able to print those at school, but you can also buy those pre-printed. Um, but it seems to me like $500 is your... Below that, you're, you're dealing with a pretty rickety thing, and um, you can go as far above that as you want, uh, but that you can make a solid thing. So then um, I, I really like the idea that, oh, okay, if we want to expand our capability to do this, we don't necessarily have to have um, tens of thousands of dollars. We could just one at a time kind of build these. So I had a class, again, getting back to this slide, um, where as a class we built a couple of these things. And I'll admit, it was a terrible struggle. Like, I'm sitting there trying to explain how to do the electrical part of it, which is, I've never studied, so, and I'm thinking, uh, there's, you know, I've got to really hit the books. But the best piece of advice I ran across um, on one of these internet forums, and that's where I'm getting a lot of these information, is, is to find people who have complementary skill sets who are interested in the same stuff. And for me, as somebody who's a little bit uh, introverted when I'm not at work, um, it was a good impetus to kind of like reach out to people in other areas. Maybe there's somebody in, elect you know, in engineering I could talk to about this who's also trying to do the same thing, and, and they maybe would like what I'm doing with my uh, equipment here. And that turned out to be the case. Um, and now, I mean, with an event like this, like Maker Week, I, I love the idea that that extends itself to, to everybody in the community. And it was amazing to see, when you look at these designs that are online, and there's dozens of them, that some of them are by, let's say, a retired engineer who knows everything about everything, right? But other ones are like a 16-year-old kid, you know, just designed this thing and posted it up. And you're, how? How? <laughs> Did he have that knowledge? Um, we tried things that worked and tried things that didn't work as well. So I had a student who, um, one of the things that's tricky about 3D printing, that plastic filament, is that there's a big markup on that stuff. It's pretty expensive for what it is. It's just plastic, right? But it, it can cost as much as like $50 for two pounds of it. So we kind of were like, let's build the machine that makes the plastic filament. We'll short circuit the whole process, you know? Then we can just buy like chunks of plastic or in a perfect world, we can like shred uh, plastic you know, refuse like this thing, and we'll run it through the printer. There's a lot of complications in that, it turns out. It's less simple, but we're ha I, it's interesting to think about that, that uh, I would love to think if I had a student who really needed to print something in a pinch, that they could raid the university's recycle bin, gather as many, you know, whatever plastic things as they need, shred them in a paper shredder, make this filament, and then do that. And I have a background in ceramics, so there's a bit of an analogy there. Like if you're doing ceramics and you're broke, you can always go out with a shovel and, and like just, you know, hit some clay and find something. So we built this, really my student built this um, uh, filament extruder and it kind of worked. I can say that we've extruded a filament that we then printed something with. Um, but it's not something we're using a lot. It turns out there, you have to know a lot of 
sort of uh, a lot about a lot about plastics. Um, so it's kind of stalled out at the moment. But it was an interesting experiment. It didn't cost us much again because it was an open source design. And so some of these things are alleyways that you go down and you just kind of eh, turn around. And other things have been really great. So for me personally, this was the end result of the machine that I built, and I'm very pleased with it. And and it's it's been working fantastically. And when you build the thing, um, inevitably you're going to have to do maintenance and repair stuff. So it's a lot easier if you actually built it. I took this to a workshop in Colorado in a hard case suitcase, you know? It was in the wintertime, so I'm at the airport and my suitcase comes out and it's just fractured on all four sides, right? With the printer inside of it. So before I even open the suitcase, I'm like, there's bad things happening in there. And this uh, printer is here so that I can do this workshop. <laughs> which has not begun yet, and they told me, you know, it's, it's below freezing outside, the plastic really gets brittle, and they do just fling this stuff around, you know, when they're moving these cases. So I opened up the suitcase, and I think like three or four of these plastic components had completely shattered. They did have one other printer at this place, so I printed those three or four components because I had the files, and then I reassembled the machine that night, and I was ready for day one with a rebuilt um, machine, zero dollars invested in that, so it was kind of a cool thing. It's like, don't worry, I can just remake the parts. As long as the metal stuff doesn't get bent, uh, you're kind of, or the electrical stuff destroyed, you're in good shape. Um, so that's that first printer, and um, it, it has kind of multiplied a little bit. Um, and this was just a shot of um, our little area, and so we've been able to cobble things together. That old, old MakerBot machine in the right it doesn't actually work, but it's a wonderful antique. Uh, five years old, that makes it an antique. Um, it's like no one uses that anymore, you know, gone. Um, this one is called the Lulzbot, another manufacturer out of uh, Colorado, a wonderful machine that's very open source. So when it doesn't work right, you can call them and they'll tell you uh, what they think they would do. They're not very proprietary about the information for that. This one down here was built with the intention of printing clay. It might actually do that at some point, but it's in process. And then that's my machine and the one that the students built uh, next to it. I'm going to flip through these. These are just images of some exhibitions that involve a lot of digital fabrication things. Um, I also like when people mix it up. This is a ceramic piece that has 3D printed plastic on the top, a ceramic element in the middle, and plastic on the bottom. I think it's kind of cool to see these things. It's neat to see a material that we value a lot next to a material that we see as a throwaway material. Um, this technology has been great for scaling things up, so you know, designing something on the computer and then uh, using that to sort of generate much larger forms. Um, my favorite thing I've heard about 3D printing is the phrase, uh, complexity is free. Uh, and I love that. If you're building things as an artist or an architect or engineer, typically you achieve complexity by putting many, many parts together, which is time consuming and expensive. Um, but if you're printing something like this elephant, um, if it's in the design file, then the complexity is free. It doesn't cost any more to print. In fact, it probably costs less to print than if it was just a solid uh, form. So to me, that's a kind of conceptual change. Like we can introduce pattern and decoration and all kinds of things um, without added um, expense. It's interesting. Um, so these are all just different applications. One thing that students do is they go places that you can't possibly get because they have different uh, energy and skills. Um, so a couple of the students really got into kind of um, programming uh, their 3D models, you know, making uh, algorithmic designs. So this Lego figure here. Um, was modeled and then, and then he wrote a script that would randomly fill it with these pipes and we printed that in several parts. It was a really wonderful piece. Another student wrote a really interesting script that would generate this tile, but each time he generates it, the pattern would be different. It's really nice to think like you could start tiling a room and the pattern would never repeat, you know, because each one will be printed out different. Um, I'll show a little bit of what I do, and I've been an artist for much longer than I've been interested in, in this whole maker movement and the DIY um, approach to digital fabrication. I studied ceramics, and before that I studied painting. I make a lot of small objects. A lot of, they're generally abstract. They tend to have a lot of um, kind of hard-edged geometry, and quite often recently um, they start as a computer model. I really like drawing on the computer. And I always struggle with sort of how do I get the thing back out of the computer? That's the thing that's interesting to me is not what's going on on screen, but what happens next, right? So 3D printing has been fantastic to experiment with form like this. Um, then there's other things like these are all slip cast ceramic. And so none of these are 3D printed, but they were all 3D printed as little plastic uh, components, which I then made molds from. And then I could take those modules and stick them together and get an endless array of um, results out of that. And when I first started using the processes, that was the only way to do it because the prints were so expensive. 
you know, you print a little thing like this for $70, you know. So it's like, well, I better make a mold and make 100 of them to justify that. Um, so once I built my own machine, it was great because that, that cost went down to the floor, right? Um, another way that I like to toy around with getting things out of the computer is to unfold them. Um, so I like finding models. Um, NASA makes really nice 3D models available. The Smithsonian makes really wonderful 3D models available. So I took this Gemini spacecraft and just really dumbed it down to this little form that's on the right. Was able to use a, a, a very inexpensive, um, actually free software to unfold that into this little map. And what's cool about that, I could just print it in any old printer and cut it with a knife and fold it back up. You don't have to have any digital fabrication equipment, really. Um, and so I made this version of it out of wood. So I enjoyed this piece. It looked like the Gemini spacecraft, but also kind of looks like a dress form or like a broom or something else. Um, and, and made several pieces at different scales that use this kind of faceted uh, method. So a lot of these are made out of wood. I should mention that the digital part of like cutting it out and folding it takes like no time, like a weekend. And then the woodworking part takes forever, like any other woodworking. There, I have no secret way of working with wood that is any faster than any other woodworking technique. It's been fun to do things with foundation students, to draw little um, you know, geometric forms, lay them out, cut them with box cutters, and, and then assemble these big forms out of cardboard. Um, so I try and do a lot of that, where we're, we're really doing things by hand, but we're using some of this design language. And finally, I'll talk about... Um, in the last year or so, uh, since I've had access to my own machine on my own terms, I can 3D print whenever, and, and I've really gotten interested in taking the language of things that I make and, um, and, and just seeing, like, well, what happens if I don't make molds of all of them and make them all ceramic? What if I just play with them as, as uh, printed things? And so for somebody who's interested in art, uh, interested in design, interested in prototyping, I think these technologies are suddenly very, very accessible. Um, you know, the material isn't necessarily good for functional parts that are going to bear a lot of weight, but of course that doesn't matter to me. I just want to play with form and shape and, um, you know, work some of these things out. And so these were really fun to print, you know, separate components all in the same kind of network where they have common dimensions and I can stack these things together. And I played around with putting a dowel rod through them or having little magnets or having them um, Velcro together, all these different ways of kind of joining these things together. And so more recently, when I exhibit artwork, um, I like a format like this where, where um, I try and kind of upend notions of what it is to work with digital stuff so that um, this thing's 3D printed, but this was entirely made by hand. And these are drawings that I drew um, painstakingly with my hand, and these other things are, are pen plotted, and this is 3D printed. And, you know, so it's kind of a mixture of these things, but they're all the same form language bouncing back and forth. Um, one of the last things I'll show is this... Um, I've really gotten interested in playing with different materials that you can print with, and I think this is what's really exciting uh, kind of going forward. Um, a little bit hard to see, but this is a filament that has a lot of sawdust in it. Um, it's a little bit hard to print, but once you get the hang of it, it works great. Um, and so this is almost like a little puzzle of geometric forms that, because they're designed uh, in a CAD software, they really do interlock really well. And if you take that thing apart, it, it's these things here. Um, and I love this material because it, it doesn't, it wouldn't mistake, you wouldn't mistake it for, um, you know, timber, but it, it is a little bit like an MDF or something like that. It doesn't feel like plastic to me. It has a really nice hand to it. So um, that's been really interesting to see what happens with those filaments. And then most recently, I guess I've been for the last few years totally into the digital fabrication, and I'm kind of working my way back to um, my training in ceramics and, and really getting into that. So um, this was a 3D printing, uh, a, a ceramic 3D printer that is not mine, um, but I, I, I try and follow, I like, obsessively search this stuff online, like, is there a new 3D printer that prints ceramic yet? You know, and I email people and I ask them about what they're doing. So uh, a guy in Florida built this wonderful machine, um, very specific to pottery, um, very like handmade, but it does a wonderful job of printing clay. So I sent him a couple of files, and this is one of my forms being printed by that. Um, and it does a really great job. It's printing very thick layers, um, which is kind of interesting to me. The thing I would want to do most when I saw this is take it as a wet clay thing and then start to really manipulate it. I didn't have that option because he's in Florida. He can't ship me a wet clay thing. I can't afford this machine that he's got. Um, so I'm in a bit of a quandary, but it's really exciting um, territory for this material. And I'll, I'll finish up, that's my last slide, um, with a kind of you know, nerdy thing that I've been working on, which is this um, uh, a clay extruder. Um, and again, this has been a great motivation to kind of reach out to other people because I'm way out of my depth with this. 
And it's very simple, but the notion is that um, instead of feeding plastic through here, you know, when these gears turn, this little um, plunger goes down and, and clay will just ooze out of this little syringe at the bottom. I don't know if it'll work. I think it will. Um, it's going to take a lot of calibration and stuff. Um, but I have been able to, to contact um, a few people who, who just know mechanics a lot better than I do. Uh, and that's the interesting part. And it's interesting to meet up with people who might want to print ceramic for totally not artistic reasons. They might want to make you know, functional things. And so um, one of the things that's great about the technology is it has forced people together because it's not widespread. So you've got to share stuff. And there is a part of me that's like already a little bittersweet for a moment when everything's accessible enough that we don't have to like work together, you know, like um, in the early days of computing, you know, not everybody had a, a desktop computer, so these maybe strange alliances emerged. Um, so I kind of hope that digital fabrication and the maker movement, all this stuff stays a little bit like that, because there's something that's a little bit disappointing about everybody being able to do everything in their own little, in their own little world. Um, so that's why I love something like a make space, that you might have a... Uh, architect, a designer, an engineer, an artist, all um, not exactly sure what their role is there and communicating in an interesting way. And I'll finish on that. So make space is a, uh, a site, a website? Uh, no, really a physical place. It's a concept, and Dave could speak to it better than I could, I'm sure, but a, a shared facility like a workshop um, that might include really traditional tools like a drill press, a table saw, things that would generally be maybe a little bit out of the reach of an individual person. It's almost like a, a membership type of a thing where um, if you had a community-based make space, um, you might pay a membership fee and go there. Or um, if something like that was housed in a public building like the library, you know, anybody could, could use that. Dave, I'm sure you have a better synopsis of what that is. That was, that was fantastic, Tom. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Yeah, truly. <laughs> Thank you. So I have about 3,000 questions I want to ask Tom, and I'm going to try and like defer those. But um, to go to the make space concept, uh, we do have in State College, we have a, a make space, a very small one. It's a sort of toehold in the community. And uh, there's a bunch of very committed people who are passionate about making that have gathered together. And just as Tom is saying, you know, they, they come from all walks of life. They're all ages. And uh, I'll tell you where it is if you haven't been there. And we can go over tonight. After this talk, there's going to be a little bit more of a sort of, um, I guess, uh, informal discussion about 3D printing. So if anybody's interested, we can walk on over. But it's located below the Fraser parking garage. If you know that little alleyway that's sort of on the high side of the hill, what is it, 141 South Fraser, I think is the address. But uh, there's a tiny little walkway. There's a used guitar shop or brand new and used, I don't know, guitar <laughs> shop. Guitar Alley, it's right in there. So if you look down below, you'll see the make space. And every Wednesday, there are, um, there's open house. And if you want to join, you can. it's like a $20 a month fee to join. You get a key, and you can go in and make things. Uh, there are no rules at all, <laughs> which, is, which is for many people both a plus and sometimes can be a con, right? <laughs> uh, so you see how that works out. But regarding um, some of these tools, who has, who's got some burning questions for Tom here? Anybody have it? Is this lit any personal fires for any of you? I was thinking like even you know, the clay material here or, or the wood uh, um, material, you know, things that have the wood composite. You really have to be pretty critical about the mix. I mean, you know, how you control the medium. Yes. And, and, um, I think you must have like different sized needles or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, that's very true. And even printing plastic, um, as, as you spend any time with these 3D printers, and, and you know, at some point you'll be banging your head against the wall and like, why, why, what am I doing wrong? Because there's a million things that can go wrong. Um, and with the clay, maybe especially so, um, although um, it, it, it's been very interesting. A couple of years ago, I kind of surveyed what was out there. And it didn't seem like there was any activity in terms of trying to print with clay. Like a couple people did so far and then just kind of walked away. In the last year or so, I've seen a lot of people um, solving a lot of these problems, and it's, so it's been interesting. But yeah, um, with something like clay, the consistency is important. And the, but then again, like if any of you have ever uh, thrown pottery or hand-built clay, like, yeah, it's not easy either. You know? So it, it, if you can take somebody who has that skill, who's been um, working with clay for a while, that part will be sort of easy for them. 
and the, the 3D printing piece will be very hard. But it's interesting to me because for other people, the, the printing part makes sense, but the, the, the wilderness of what clay is, is is the part that they need help with. So that's where the, the intersections are interesting. But you're right, the tolerances are very, it's very, it's precision work, definitely, at least at this stage. The question I have is uh, really trying to wrap your head around how you resolve the three-dimensionality using whatever this little reader is or laser reader. The scanner. Sure. So um, when we do this uh, little event tomorrow where we'll, we'll scan anybody who wants to get a scan of their torso, um, we, we put someone in a swivel chair and, and just with your tiptoes you, you kind of spin around and it's, it's photographing uh, sequentially as you go and it's also um, picking up, I believe, um, what's the other thing it picks up? Infrared light? What, what does that connect? Um, anyway, I think it reads body heat or something. <laughs> so it's kind of like remapping this thing and, and if you can stay relatively, um, you know, in, uh, and it does a good job of linking all that up. That's where the technology has gotten better. You used to have to buy hand. Yeah, I mean, you can either spin yourself around or you can physically move the scanner. But what it does is it searches for patterns that it has already looked at, right? So if I'm scanning your hat and then I move down, it tries to locate your nose in relation to your hat. If you jerk the thing around, you'll get like all kinds of horrific distortions um, so hopefully everything goes really well tomorrow with that. Um, but just spinning one person around is not so bad. Um, so it's a little tricky too. Yeah, yeah, and it's very much like, um, it, it reminds me of what portrait photography must have been when we had really long exposures, right? When you're dealing with film, uh, maybe many years ago when the portrait sitter has to stay still for like five minutes and they can't blink, you know? And anyone who walks past will just be a blur. It's a bit like that. And the technology gets better all the time. Yeah, I don't know if you've inferred this through the presentation, but we are truly in the salad days for a lot of these um, technologies. They're very, very early days, and there aren't many slick consumer packaged products. Um, there are a few that are out there, but they're really not as consumer friendly as the manufacturers would like you to believe. So, you know, Tom's reference to early days of photography. Yeah, it's a lot like that. You're going to encounter all kinds of unexpected hiccups and challenges. And oftentimes, these are opportunities to do some new things because they provoke this uh, kind of opportunity to make something else. So, Yeah, maybe it's a good analogy because uh, some of the homemade machines, the really basic ones, are a bit like a pinhole camera. You know, it'll, it'll make a thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if get you're something. getting serious about photography, at some point you might graduate to an actual lens, right? You know? <laughs> Um, so it's interesting because there's all those steps and, and the, the community of people who are building these things and posting them as an open source thing is very interesting because um, it's kind of like they come up with some innovation and you can just basically download and print and add that innovation to your machine. And sometimes it works great and other times you're like, that is not what you described. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, I feel like the thing, now that I built that machine, it's not fixed in that configuration. I would imagine as people smarter than me put more and more innovation into it, I can you know, be the recipient of that to some degree. But. Yeah, and one of the things too, and let me, um, let me just add a point, I'll get to you. If you may have noticed when you went through this, there's sort of two different angles to these technologies, and if you broadly separate them, one is called subtractive, which is mm -hmm. carving things out, mm -hmm. and the other one is additive, which is building from nothing, creating something. So this 3D printing is sort of an additive technology, and this is really the hot new area because there aren't a lot of additive technologies. We've had subtractive technologies for a super long time, like milling and lathing and things like that. Those have been driven by machines for centuries, right? But now we have computers that are doing that. So yeah. broadly, you get these sort of two distinctions, and then you get to combine them and mix them up. So that's where the fun stuff happens. And then you add in the hand tools, you know, the hand effects, which I think Tom right. did some pretty cool stuff with. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I had two questions. Sure. Um, first of all, that puzzle that you showed, yeah. um, <clears throat> were you able to put that back together? <laughs> And the second question is, you showed a bunch of pictures that appear to be in a museum gallery or something like that. Is there some place where we can go to see these? Yeah, good, good questions, both of them. The first one, the puzzle, I can put it together, but it takes me forever, uh, and I designed the thing. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a conception of it as it's 150 millimeters by 150 millimeters by 50. It's really little. Um, and I want to make a really nice box, like a wooden box for it. And I, and I decided if I etch the pattern at the, at the base and the top of the box, at least you'd be able to 
you know, match up those things. I, my, I have a daughter who's four. I gave it to her. There was no way that was coming back together. Um, but I, I like the idea. That, but then she took it and stacked them all and made other cool stuff. So I was okay with that. But uh, yeah, it is a little bit like three-dimensional chess. Um, so that's tough. And then the thing about the museum gallery. Um, yeah, so um, this is one of the things that is tough uh, when you teach art at the university. You, at the end of the semester, you might have a final critique of students' work. And you never quite know how that's going to turn out, right? And sometimes there's just astonishing things. And, and it's bittersweet because you think, this is in this room for the next two hours, and then it's going to go away, and then nobody's going to see it. And so it's a bit of a bummer. So um, we are really interested in, in trying to, um, at, as I can speak for the School of Visual Art, increase our sort of outreach. You know, There are student exhibitions um, that some of those images were from. Um, but if you didn't go to every single student exhibition, you wouldn't necessarily know when that's coming up. We haven't done an exhibition here at Penn State that is specifically about digital fabrication, but I suspect that that's in the works, at least from the architecture may have done that or engineering may have done that, but we haven't done that as a school of visual arts. And if something like Maker Week is something that um, uh, it happens more than once, I mean, certainly that would be uh, the venue, right, for that. So a lot of those images were from other places. Um, I, I make work and I, I show it, and a lot of times the shows aren't here just because, you know, larger cities have more art galleries and that type of thing. Uh, but I think it'd be great to have... Um, if the make space concept grows and grows in State College, it would be a natural fit to have a sort of a gallery uh, as part of that, um, you know, to display the work. Yeah. Does anybody have some other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. I started a moment ago. I have 150 millimeters by 150 millimeters by 50 millimeters. Yeah. This is America. You know, it's, 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 which is, <laughs> you, you can tell he's a rebel, right? You go, you go to the Home Depot and you have no idea what a millimeter is. Um, no, it, it's an interesting point. It's, like, it's almost like photography when you know, painters like the Dutch school were trying to get perfection and the photographers came along and, well, what do you do next? Uh, um, right. And I was struck by if, if you move somebody quickly, all the features would, would be right. distorted. So obviously that's exactly what Pablo Picasso would have done. Uh, yeah. Uh, move the chair quickly. But, but it was an interesting case of what one of your artists who, who, who got, you know, these these sort of mechanical things which are done, you know, you don't have to be an artist to do that, and incorporate them in his art. But I guess you, you, you come across the problem where, you know, the road down Mark II will get somebody to pose there, a machine will make a perfect 3D image and then would carve a perfect 3, 3D image and would, he would set the roughness scale and the, you know, <laughs> uh, the kind of an odd distortion, you know, to show a human factor and there would be a, a perfect statue with not a single piece of uh, creative art mm. incorporated in it. So, you sure. know, so somehow you've got to kind of yeah. be there, just like, you know, like, like, like in the... In the no, I, it, it's a wonderful comment. And, and certainly anyone who's dealt with photography as an art form has come across that because, because it's, it's rife with those problems. And I do, I, my experience of talking to a lot of young artists is that there's no consensus. Uh, some people are 100% comfortable exhibiting a thing that they literally never touched, um, which isn't that crazy when you think about it. And then there are other people who really insist, like, not only am I going to make everything, but I'm going to make that material from scratch, or I'm going to go cut down the tree that I'm going to use the wood for. So it's kind of like, where do you stop that? And I had that issue myself as somebody who's deeply invested in working with my hand. And I think, honestly, like a big reason I wanted to build the machine, apart from having access, doing it cheaply, being able to upgrade it, was really like, well, if I made the machine, <laughs> then really by default, I made everything that comes out of that machine. I'm the author now. Because it, it's, its quirks and eccentricities are the result of my limited ability to build this thing. And I'm also a little bit, um, you know, Dave was talking about how early we are in this. I'm already anxious about, like, I'm not sure I'm going to be excited when the technology gets so good that you can't tell the things printed. Um, because there is something that I love about um, being able to examine if, if, if you printed something and I looked at it, I could, I could scrutinize it and we could talk about how you did that. And when things get to a certain level of polish, um, they just become mysterious in a way that doesn't have that entry point as far as making, right? Like the making is, is maybe secondary. I read recently that the, they're, they're using um, this kind of printing, three-dimensional printing, to create human tissue and human organs. So, you know, there you are. <clears throat> yeah.
over. That's beyond my pay grade, certainly, um, but it's a thing. Yeah, well, yeah. This is this is completely true. We are again very early days. Almost every industry that deals with artifacts on the planet is looking at three D printing as a possible way to introduce something novel or solve a problem that they are having difficulty with. And organs, it's tremendously huge. I mean, they're talking. They are doing early tissue scaffolding and things to grow tissues on. So it's pretty phenomenal. Um, the one thing that I, that I want to add, though, is that what, what Tom's doing, you've heard him say it multiple times, and, and this is the part that, to me, gets really interesting, because you don't have to be an artist to be interested in these technologies. You have to just be a curious mind, uh, or have one. Uh, you may also be a curious mind, like myself. Um, <laughs> but the, if you look at MIT's Media Lab, people talk a lot about, um, well, how, what's, the, what's the secret formula there? And I'm told from some people who have spent time at the, at the Media Lab is what they do is it's a really simple recipe. They, they say, here, you've got skills here, might be like a Nobel Prize, and you've got skills here, which might be equivalent or higher. And how, what do you think about working together? But the only thing is you can't do this or this. You have to go somewhere here of equal discomfort. And that's the opportunity for learning and engagement is when you have two people with certain skills that are kind of nervous and kind of scared yeah, about where yeah, they're going right. because that's when you really have to reach deep into the other and you're not dragging one person into the other zone. And the reason these digital tools are so fantastic is they, they just absolutely smash disciplinary boundaries because people are using the same tool. They could be a, a biophysicist or they could be an artist. They're using the exact same mechanical tool and they're using the exact same software. So all of a sudden, you have this ability to communicate that is just completely, it's jargon free. You've stripped all the jargon away. So, you know, I was involved in this initial network, network mapping that, um, mm -hmm. that Tom showed and the idea was it's a digital water cooler. That's what we have now today. You know, the water coolers where people, you know, talk about things and create and explore. Well, these tools are a digital water cooler because it's common ground that people share. So it doesn't matter where you are, but all you have to do is say, hey, I'm kind of curious about what's going on, and you start meeting people, and the next thing you know, you're dragged into some wacky project, and then maybe you sell something like a MakerBot printer for $430 million, which grew out of a make space, not unlike the one down here in State College. So anybody have any other questions? I had a comment comments? about the metric yeah. system. <laughs> uh, yeah, go for it, Tom. Um, it's a funny thing. Uh, the first thing that, that made me, uh, I have a lot of international students, so I have to know both, because um, like, they're like, what, why is a, f and I'm like, well, there was this king, and his foot was this big, and uh, anyway. Um, but the thing that's interesting with the 3D printing is um, there's quite a lot of activity outside of the United States, a huge amount of activity outside of the United States. And so um, if you were to post a design and you wanted it to be widely adopted, it, you would definitely want to do that metric because, you know, everyone else's Lowe's or Home Depot. Well, 4964 for an inch hour. Yeah, so, um, so it was just, uh, you know, I realized that's the language of this thing. Um, and, it, and it was kind of an interesting thing to, to learn about that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Who has uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah. I was just curious, what's the like max size that your printer makes? Sure. And do you make like, are your students making more like a model and then they're like building off of that or are they actually using individual pieces? So we're very limited in terms of the 3D printing and scale for a couple of reasons. One is the printer itself. Um, most of them are between 8 and 12 inches in any direction. 150 to 300 millimeters. Um, and so you get a cube that's like less than one cubic uh, uh, foot. And so that's a, that's a real limitation. The other limitation is the materials are still fairly expensive. So even if you did want to maximize that space, um, it costs a decent amount of money in materials. And then the, the huge limitation is time. Like these, that head that I passed around is maybe an 11 or 12 hour print. And so for 12 hours, nothing can go wrong with the machine, which is in, in, the, in some of these machines, that's an eternity. Um, thankfully, more recently, it seems like we've been able to consistently do these longer prints. So if you want to really scale things up, you've either got to have a whole bunch of machines. There are a few exotic machines out there that print really large, but that's not, there's nothing that's on the market that's like in any way affordable that does massive um, scale printing. Um, so there's also a lot of creativity about that. How do you lash these parts together? 
how can you combine the printed thing with like something you can get at Home Depot that you can like fat lash it all together? You know, could I take wooden dowel rods and just make plastic connectors and build up a big thing? And um, artists, I think, don't always get enough credit as uh, tinkerers and inventors, um, and often out of necessity. If you're a sculptor, you're just making up processes all the time. You don't then transmit them to other people, so they kind of people don't necessarily know how weird it is to to sculpt the figure and all the weird armatures that might be inside of that. So it is a thought process that doesn't seem alien to art students or to, or, um, to artists in general. And I'm sure that's true of a lot of uh, design professionals and engineers as well. So, um, so yeah, right now it's, it's very difficult to do larger scale, but it's, it's, it's fun to kind of dream about it and think about how you can circumvent those limitations. But my machine, uh, eight by eight by eight inches is what it does. So. How do you sort out the available software that makes it compatible with your equipment or vice versa? You know, how do you know what to choose? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, sleepless nights. This is sleepless where sleepless nights. This is where the conversation happens. Where you can throw a lot of money down the hole too. Yeah. And it works. Oh, yeah, you certainly can. And but this is where it's like, you know, if, if I know someone like Dave, I can say, Dave, what do you use? You're getting good results. I'm not getting good results. What are you using? And so that's really the best, uh, the best way, right? And um, I also gravitate towards any software that's free because, you know, that's a big plus for me. And one of the things that's very funny to me, I model my models in a very sophisticated 3D modeling thing that I took courses to learn, and I'm, I teach that to other people. I'm very confident in that. And then I'll see a really nice thing, and I'll ask the student, like, well, what program did you use? And they're like, oh, just this thing I found. It's in a web browser. You don't even have to down, you know. So it's, it's like, you just undercut my whole education there. Like, you just bypassed me, and I don't know how to use that thing that you're using that costs nothing. And that, that's interesting, too, because there's software for engineering. There's software that a friend of mine in uh, atmospheric science uses that can all generate 3D models, but I wouldn't have a chance at, like, trying to understand those softwares. But they share um, file formats, most of them. So it is nice. something that was as simplistic as SketchUp, you know, interface. Almost all the parts for the, the type of machine that I built, which is called a RepRap, um, were originally uh, done in SketchUp. I mean, people have since moved them into all other programs. But um, quite a lot of 3D modeling, um, if you go out there and look at where um, 3D models are available, um, quite a lot of it is done in SketchUp. I'm going to give you the hot tip of the day that I just got through Maker Week. Uh -huh. And there's a program that you, if you're interested in this, it's called OnShape. Dot com. It's a website. That's a good one. Have you heard yeah. about this? Yeah. You I haven't it? used it, but I've looked at okay, it. Okay, yeah. so I, I'm looking at it, and I think this is the thing that I'm going to start looking That's at. That's the it's one, It's a huh? solid modeler. Yeah. And there's, we could talk a lot about, like, software, and if we go over to the make space, since we're running out of time, you know, we can chat a lot more about software and things. But uh, Onshape is basically made by some of the original people involved in a company that's very popular among engineers called SolidWorks. And... You know, I think what Tom's probably referring to, you're referring to Rhino? Is that yes. It? Yeah. So there are these other modelers called like surface modelers where you're just dealing with almost like sheets of paper, except they can be stretchy and curved and they can make really crazy shapes. So, you know, it depends on the kind of modeling you want to do, but you can also do stuff in SketchUp, which is free. There's all kinds of other Tinkercad. Tinkercad which, is really good. Yeah, now. it's really good. Yeah. It's so good I can't log into it anymore, and that's the only thing that's got me really oh, bothered. Really? And they they won't provide any support right now. Oh yeah, because well, their yeah. back end is being rebuilt, so they won't tell you why you can't log in. But um, you know, this is the kind of thing you 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 do. There's a resourcefulness. There's a ton of resourcefulness happening. Um, I need to just because I know people want to get moving. I want to just review a couple of things that are coming sure. up that you might be interested in, and uh, we can chat afterwards a little bit. And over in the corner here is John Stitzinger. He is one of the founders of the MakeSpace, and I think, John, are you walking people over afterwards? Okay, so um, schedule-wise, tomorrow, print your head. Hmm. Actually, I think we're scanning your head, and I need to just let you know the UPS store, we have one of 50, 50 locations, 51 or two in the U.S., with a 3D printer here up um, in the mall on North Atherton, sort of across from Wegmans. They are going to be printing your, your scanned head. And they've offered a screaming deal. Uh, for 15 bucks, you can go up and get your head printed. And that's a, a really discounted rate. So um, we have to, we extend their, you know, our thanks for their support for this. So it's noon to four in the teen area here tomorrow. Um, there is going to be another panel, uh, well, there's Glass Fusion Workshop in the afternoon, but there's another discussion panel with, like, industry here tomorrow night at 6.30, and you can go over and hang out with the people in the make space again afterwards. Um, Friday, there's a robotics demo here, 
and there's an idea gym exploring that at New Leaf. And then there are going to be singing Tesla coils and lots of other <laughs> et cetera, like uh, lit propane tube sound uh, visualizers, again, at the Make Space. And then on Saturday, there's going to be a really big community-wide uh, piece in the park where makers are going to bring their stuff and show it off. And if you're a maker and want to bring something, I think talk to Nathaniel and he'll tell you where to go. Um, but that's kind of the overview. And this is Great. our first year to do this. So if you like what you're hearing and get involved, uh, we're trying to grow the make space into bigger, bigger facilities at some point with more equipment. And um, we're, you're welcome to come down and check it out. So anything Great. else? Any other parting comments? Tom, anybody? Yes. Sometimes older methods are quicker. Uh, a neighbor uh, convinced me to try casting my head in plaster, you know, we put my head in a box and yeah. he put straws and yeah. put Vaseline on and and uh, then I, uh, after it solidified, I painted the inside with this uh, rubber latex stuff and made my own rubber mask and that was my Halloween costume. <laughs> <laughs> you went, you went as yourself? Yeah, excellent. That's much, that's much quicker, though, than all this uh, digital. I have one comment about that, which is related. Yeah. There's a, um, the Smithsonian has been posting really high-quality 3D models of some of their um, things because there's no copyright or, or um, anything like that that they're worried about with these public objects. One of the things that they posted were um, a life mask of Abraham Lincoln made that way, right? So he was the sitting president. They said, we want a good physical likeness of him. They had one of the best sculptors of the day come in and make a plaster, mo incredibly detailed plaster model of that. So then the Smithsonian scanned that and they, it's for free on their website. So I was able to download it and print it and, and have Abe Lincoln's very, you know, interesting head uh, sitting there and, and you can kind of like run your hands. And so it's really interesting because it was like when that was created so long ago, you know, it's this fragile plaster thing and it's probably about, like if you picked it up, I'm sure it wouldn't be all that durable, but to scan it and then suddenly you can distribute it or anybody who's interested in Abe Lincoln could print the thing. So it's kind of an interesting meeting of those. So. Oh yeah, this, th these things are not often faster. But the, other, but the thing is they're replicable and scalable, which is the crazy part. So you may put a ton of time into that first one, but then you can make infinite copies at any yeah. scale. I never claim to have ever saved any time. Oh no, absolutely <laughs> not. I would not do that. So no. uh, let me mention, uh, since Glo, this is our first time and we're looking to learn from this, uh, we have a survey right here. And if you want to fill that out, that would be super helpful, appreciated. And you can actually win a fully customized 3D printed smartphone case. Awesome. Courtesy again of the UPS store. So um, thank you so much for coming and come on over to the Make Space. Thank you, Tom. All right, thank you.